Okay, so today we are going to continue on with our statics lecture. Last week we talked about forces and reactions. We talked about drawing those, how forces are a vector, how we can add them up, um, even if they're not in the same line. If they're in the same line, that's easy, it's linear. But if they're not in the same line, it becomes a little bit harder to add them up. And we talked about how we can go about doing that. And so we know that statics means a thing isn't moving. It means it's not going up and down and back and forth and in and out of the page. But what about spinning? We haven't talked about it trying to spin. If it's spinning, it's moving. Now, we're not talking about internal small movements. We're talking about the object trying to spin in space. We don't want it to do that either. So this, in this lecture, we're going to talk about moment because that is what is happening. If it's trying to spin, we're talking about moment being applied. So we're going to talk about what moment is, how we define it, um, and then we're going to talk about how you can have moment with force or moment without force. Um, and then we're going to start looking at um, analyzing objects with a force on them and how we ensure it doesn't move around in space. So let's dig in with moments. Before we talk about what a moment is, I just want to have a few uh, vocabulary words on hand that'll make it helpful to talk about this. So the first one is centroid. And most of you, I think, intuitively understand centroid. It can be the center of mass, the center of gravity, or the center of inertia, depending how you want to talk about it. What it essentially is, the mean position of matter in a body, or the point about which a body will rotate if spinning freely. So if not restrained, it's the point it will spin about. It is the intersection of all the neutral axes or median lines. So you can have a variety of neutral axes through an object. The neutral axes about which it's spinning, that neutral axis passes through that centroid. <clears throat> we'll often draw this symbol to represent centroid. So if we have this object here, and we dangle it from this string, it will try to spin about that line. I should, now that I'm doing this uh, over video, I should have gotten something with a string on it. But if, uh, I was going to say, you know, how you would take a foreign phone cord and hang it and it would spin, but none of you have probably had a landline in your home. Um, uh, so if you take an object and you dangle it from a string, it will spin about its centroid along the neutral axis. And this neutral axis passes through that centroid. What happens if the line that you're trying to hang it about isn't about the centroid? Well, this thing is going to spin to get in line with that. It's going to try to line that up with the neutral axis. Okay, so that was just to talk about centroid. Now, if we have a force applied concentrically to a body, it will move or translate in line with the applied force. Basically, if we have a force that we apply along the neutral axes through the centroid, so along this line that passes through the centroid, just like this, if we push on this object, it will slide. I think you guys intuitively understand that. Um, I don't have it. One of my children has. Oh, I did not steal my eraser. If I have this eraser like this and I push on it through its neutral axes, it slides. If I apply a moment about this object, I think you guys know that it will try to spin. So you apply a moment about the neutral axis, and this will spin or rotate. What happens when you apply a force not through the central or through the neutral axis? What happens if you apply a force right here? Stop and think about it for a minute. Is it going to slide? 
Well, yeah, there's a force trying to push it in that direction. So it's trying to slide in this direction. But there's another thing happening. Do you think it's going to try to spin a little bit? And I think intuitively you know that it will try to spin. If I push on this right here like this, not in line with the neutral axes, it's going to try to rotate. Now I've restrained it from sliding by pinching it with my fingers, but you can see that it tried to spin. So it tries to slide and spin. What happens if we apply a force through the centroid and a moment? So if we apply these two things, it slides and spins. So this looks the exact same as that. So a force through the centroid and a moment about the centroid is the same thing as a force eccentric from the centroid. So moment causes a body to rotate. If you apply a force eccentric from a body's center of mass, it will cause it to rotate. The farther away, so this force being eccentric from the centroid seems to have an impact on how much it tries to spin. So if you took an eraser and pinched it with your fingers and pushed here versus pushing here, you would feel that it spins a lot easier. So you move the force further away from the centroid, the more it wants to spin. So there seems to be some relationship with how far away that force is from the centroid. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the definition of moment. Moment is a force some distance away from the centroid. And we quantify it by multiplying the force times that distance. So, oh look, I'm too big. So we have here a force through the centroid and a moment is the same thing as a force some distance from the centroid. Well, the force and the force are the same, and this moment is the, is the, the multiplication of this force times this eccentricity. So an eccentric force is the same as force and a moment, and the moment is the product of the force times the eccentricity. So these two things are equal. A force with an eccentricity is the same as the force through the centroid, and a moment, where the moment is the force times the eccentricity. So to have a moment, you have to have a force with an eccentricity. Those two things are equivalent. So an eccentric force is equivalent to a force through the centroid plus a moment about the centroid. So let's take a look at this calculation here. We have a force some distance over here, and it is 0.5 meters away. So we have 25 kilonewtons 0.5 meters away from the centroid. So our force is 25 kilonewtons. And moment is force times eccentricity. So we have 25 kilonewtons times 0.5 meters, or 25 times 0.5 equals 12.5 kilonewton meters. And that is the units that we're going to use for moment, or newton, newton millimeters. We will often use that as well, but it's a force times a distance. So here that is written out, and these two things are equivalent. 25 kilonewtons, 0.5 meters away from the centroid, is the exact same as 25 kilonewtons about, or sorry, 12.5 kilonewton meters 
about the centroid and 25 kilonewtons passing through the centroid. So both of these are going to try to translate and spin the exact same amount. So these two systems are equivalent. What if we, we didn't, didn't want a thing to have a force on it? What if we wanted to try to represent a force with um, a distance, but we didn't want it to translate? So we only want to duplicate trans or rotation, but not the translation. We need something to stop it from trying to slide. Well, what's the best thing to stop a force going this way? Apply a force going this way. So if we have two forces going in opposite directions, they'll cancel each other out. And if we offset them from the centroid, they'll both try to cause the object to spin in the same direction. So the two forces can cancel each other out for translation, but work together for rotation. So you can see here that we have a moment causing it to spin. This is going to cause it to spin in this direction. And this force is going to cause it to spin in the exact same direction. But the two forces are going to cancel each other out. So this would cause a moment like this. This would cause a moment like this. We'd have a force going here and a force going here that would cancel each other out. So let's take a look at this example right here. We have a force going downwards, and we have a force going upwards. or zero force. The summation of these is zero force on this object. It's not gonna go up, it's not gonna go down. One force is trying to push down and one force is trying to push up and they balance each other out. But we have two forces trying to cause it to spin. Even though this thing isn't translating because they're gonna balance each other out, it's still trying to make it spin. Or we've got 12.5 times 0.5 plus 12.5 times 0.5. <clears throat> I think you guys can probably do this math pretty easily. But 12.5 times 0.5 plus 12.5 times 0.5 equals... So there's no summate, there's no force because they cancel each other out, but there are two things trying to make it spin. So you could think about this two ways. If you have a moment, you could write it as two forces some distance away, or two forces some distance away you could write as a moment. So let's take a look at this. We have this added up here. So you can see that these two things are equal. The two forces are going to cancel them out, so I'm not even showing them on this example right here. We've canceled each other out here. Now, moment can be written as a vector. Remember, we could have distance as a vector, or force as a vector. You can also have moment as a vector. The reason I want to bring this up is because it helps us keep track of what direction things are spinning. Because remember, we said up was positive and down was negative, to the right was positive and to the left was negative. So how do we talk about what's positive and negative for a moment? And this is where understanding that it's a vector can really help us. If we're talking about moment as a vector, we'll often draw it as a double-hatted arrow. But this is important because that arrowhead is the positive direction. So moment can be represented as a vector. The magnitude of the vector would be moment equals force times eccentricity. The direction of a vector is parallel to the axis of rotation. So if this is trying to spin in this direction, we're saying that that arrowhead is in that direction. 
Moment vectors are represented with a double arrow, so we don't confuse it with force, just another type of vector, just so we don't get, so we don't screw up our arrows. But we're never gonna draw moment as an arrow. The reason it's important is gonna, I'm gonna show you in the next slide. So we can show it as that double hatted arrow or as a vector curling in the direction of rotation. So if this thing is trying to spin in that direction, we draw the arrow curling in that direction. Moment vectors are added the same way we would add any other vector. Now here is a really handy way to help keep track of positive and negative moments. It's something called the right hand rule. Now, snicker, get it out of your system. All right, we're gonna move on. The direction of a moment vector can be determined by your right hand. Do not use your left hand. Make sure you use your right hand Hold your right hand with your thumb up and the fingers curled. Your thumb is the direction of your moment vector and your fingers are the direction your object is trying to spin. So if you know your object is trying to spin in this direction, there's my thumb. Now my thumb is pointing up, which is the positive Y direction. So this thing is trying to spin in the positive direction about the y-axis. If I did this, my hand is still curled the same way, so I'm showing this trying to spin in the other direction because my fingers are curling in the direction an object is trying to spin. So if I change what direction it's spinning, my thumb is pointing down, well that means it's trying to spin in the negative direction about the y-axis. Curl my hand like this, now you guys are flipped from me and we just, I just went over this with my son who was learning the motion for drawing Z in a video and the actor was doing it backwards on the screen which really screwed him up and I can't imagine how that helps anyone with dyslexia. Um, so you'll have to bear with me. You're going to be curling your right hand and point your thumb to the right. Well, if your thumb is pointed to the right and I know you're seeing this to the left, but to me, my thumb is pointed to the right. My fingers are curling about the axes, which means it is spinning in the positive direction. You're seeing my thumb pointed in the y direction, in the negative direction, which must mean the object is spinning in the negative direction about the x-axis. So that's how, and same goes for the z direction. Remember we said out of the page is positive, and into the page is negative. So you can use your right hand to determine the same thing. I remember when I did my statics course, way back when, in 1996, um, in the final exam, you could see everyone holding their hand up to follow this right hand rule. So your thumb points in the positive direction, you've got a positive moment because that's the direction the thing is trying to spin. Your fingers are curling in that direction. If you know what direction a thing is trying to spin because you curl your fingers in the same way, well, your thumb can tell you if that's a positive or a negative moment. So you've often heard the term six degrees of freedom. Well, this is all the ways an object can move. Remember, we don't want our object to move. We want our object to be static. That is our goal, is to make sure we don't have buildings flying off in space or spinning around. So we want our object to be static, which means that we don't want it to move along the x-axis. We don't want it to move on the y-axis. And we don't want it to move on the z-axis but we also don't want it to spin about the x-axis. We don't want it to spin about the y-axis, and we don't want it to spin about the z-axis either. So there are six ways it can slide and six ways it can spin, and it is our job to make sure it doesn't do that in any of the directions. If it slides in any three directions or spins in any three directions, it isn't static and then it doesn't work for what we're trying to say this is, which is a building or an object that we're going to do something with. Sorry, my legs are cold. 
So we want to make sure this thing is static or that the sum of all of the forces in the y-axis are zero, the sum of all the forces in the x-axis is zero, the sum of all the forces in the z-axis is zero. That also means that the sum of all the moments about the y-axis have to be zero, the sum of all the moments about the x-axis have to be zero, and the sum of all the moments about the y-axis have to be zero. Now, working in six degrees of freedom is fracking hard. We don't want to do that. That's a lot of equations to keep track of. Six equations is surprisingly difficult to keep track of. What we'll do is often break it down into 2D space. We'll look at an XY plane, and then we can look at a YZ plane, and then we can look at an XZ plane. But most problems, we can simplify into an XY plane problem. We can make our life a lot simpler by breaking it down into a 2D problem. We acknowledge that the other planes are there and they might require our attention, or we need to think about, do we need to worry about those? Is there the possibility of those moving there? Maybe it's just so obvious that they don't move in that direction, we don't have to analyze it. Or we analyze one plane and then we analyze another plane. So if we're working in the xy plane, we are saying that there is a restraint in and out of the page, or there is no translation in the z-axis. We might have to figure out how that works later on, um, but that isn't the problem for right now. We're going to just talk about our xy plane. It can't spin about y, and it can't spin about x. So when we're trying to solve a problem in a 2D plane, we are saying that we need to make sure that the sum of all the forces in y is zero, the sum of all the forces in x is zero, and the sum of all the moments trying to spin about the z-axis is zero. Now, free body diagrams are a handy little image that help us keep track of everything. If we draw a free body diagram, we are trying to show all the forces and moments that are acting on the object. And that means forces and restraints. We want to know everything that has an impact on this object in our 2D plane. We might have to think about another 2D plane, but we're going to talk about one 2D plane at a time. So all the forces acting on a body, if it's through the center of mass, we want to know that. If it's not, we need to say how far away it is from the center of mass or from some other dimension point, some reference point that we can talk about everything being relative to. We need to know all the moments acting on the body. We need to know all the restraints keeping the body in equilibrium because if there's a force pushing down, we want to make sure it doesn't go down so there must be something holding it in place. If that thing's not there holding it in place, it's going to sink down into the center of the Earth. We want to know all dimensions from a reference point to the forces, moments, and reactions. So what does a free body diagram look like? You probably intuitively know and have recognized or even drawn a free, free body diagram in your lifetime. In fact, I've been sneaky and some of the things we've actually drawn already have been low-key free body diagrams. But this is where it starts to become important. We have to draw all the forces and moments we know are acting on our object. And then we have to make sure that this object is stable, which means it's not moving up and down, sliding back and forth, or spinning about Z. So we have to make sure there's reactions that stops that from happening. And then we can calculate what those reactions are, or what forces need to be there to restrain the object. So let's talk about a car, for example. This is a car that isn't moving forward or backwards. That's a different analysis. We have an object, we have a car that's parked. We have a weight pushing down into the ground, but we know it's not sinking down into the center of the earth, so something is stopping it from sinking down into the center of the earth. Well, there are tires sitting on the ground, so we know that there's reactions there stopping it from going down into the center of the Earth. We know that the sum of all of those must be zero because it isn't sinking down into the center of the Earth. Or we can calculate what reactions 
must be there to stop it from sinking down into the center of the earth. We've got dimensions showing how far away those reactions are, and we've got a dimension showing how far away the centroid is, or where the weight is acting through. What happens if thing, this thing is on an incline? Well, now we've got friction stopping it from sliding down the hill, because remember we're talking about a thing that is static. We want to make sure that there is enough static friction reaction there to stop it from sliding. We would figure out what reaction we need, and then maybe we'd call up a physicist and say, hey, what is the actual friction value there? Would this work? So we can see that we'd have things at funny angles that we'd maybe want to break into X and Y so we could sum things up to make sure this isn't moving in the X direction or in the Y direction. Let's talk about some of the symbols we would use when drawing free body diagrams here. Now, first off, we have our coordinate system. We know that up and down is y, back and forth, oh, in, back and forth is uh, the x direction, and in and out of the page is z. We know that up is positive for y, to the right is positive for x, and out of the page is positive for z. We're probably not going to draw this that often. We're going to intuitively know that. I drew it a couple times last week where I actually showed that Y was positive and X was positive. But we're going to get in the habit of keeping track of that for ourselves when we talk about the summing of all of our forces to make sure this thing is actually static or that the forces are zero. We know a force we'll draw as an arrow, uh, which is a vector. If it's a moment, we'll draw it as a double-headed arrow, or we'll draw it curving in the direction uh, that we're talking about. Now, we're often going to talk <clears throat> about uniformly distributed load, or a stress profile. What we're really saying is that we have a bunch of arrows side by side, or a bunch of forces equally along the length of an object. Now, Often we'll be lazy and just draw it as a few bumps acting along the uh, length of the object. Sometimes you'll see it drawn like this, or sometimes you'll see it drawn like this shaded in. These are all uniformly distributed loads. So if you wanted to think about um, if this is a um, metal deck, and this is a joist, and this is a joist, well, the uniformly distributed load means that Everywhere along the length of this joist is picking up some of that deck based on its tributary wind. So we have um, uniformly distributed loads. We'll often write uniformly distributed loads as UDL. Now I know three lectures ago, UDL meant our factored dead load combination. Don't worry about it. Look at context. See what we're talking about. It's not talking about just a dead load, we're talking about uniformly distributed loads on an object. We're gonna need some symbols to talk about these things. So if you see this triangle, that means it's a pinned support. That means we're pinning this thing in place. We've got it held here, and I've stopped it from moving up and down, and I've stopped it from moving back and forth. I have not stopped it from spinning about that point. It can still spin, but it can't go up and down and it can't go back and forth. A roller support, um, it's hard to do this in the air, a so roller support, a roller support, you can see my pen, I'm setting it on my pen, stops it from going up and down, but it doesn't stop it from rolling back and forth. It also doesn't stop it from spinning about that point. So a pin stops it going up and down and back and forth, but not rotation. A roller support stops it from going up and down, but it doesn't stop it from going back and forth or rotating. We could have a roller support up against a wall. This type of roller support stopping it from moving in the X direction but not stopping it from moving in the Y direction. It also can rotate about that point. A 
fixed connection are ones that are really hard to design, we don't use them lightly, but a fixed support is saying that I am stopping it from moving up and down, back and forth, but I'm also stopping it from spinning about that point. See, I've held it, I'm not allowing it to rotate there. I'm not allowing it to rotate about that point. So these are the different types of supports we can have, and on an object, we can combine them in some way to actually have all of these reactions. For an object, so those were our restraints. For our joints, or where two objects meet each other, we might draw a pinned connection by just showing a gap. You remember in our plans, if we had two beams coming up to each other with a little gap, that implies that that beam stops there, and it is a pinned connection, which means this object is stopping this object from going up and down and back and forth, but it's not stopping it from rotating at that point. If we see this dark filled-in triangle, we're saying that those two things are connected in such a way that it stops it from going back and forth and up and down, but it also stops it from spinning about that joint, or that there's fixed rotation. It can't rotate about that point. For a free body diagram to be static, there must be one restraint for each degree of freedom. We need something that stops it from moving in the x direction. We need something that stops it from moving in the y direction. And we need something that stops it from rotating. But do you remember that another way we could talk about moment was two forces some distance from an object? So we could, instead of having a moment restraint, we could have two reaction restraints instead, as long as it could balance out that moment. Now, a free body diagram of a beam. So here's a free body diagram we can talk about. We've got a little triangle at this end and a circle at this end. Well, we know this is a pinned support, and that means it stops it from going up and down and back and forth. So up and down, back and forth. Here we've got a roller support. So that stops it from going up and down, but it doesn't stop it from going back and forth, and it doesn't stop it from rotating. So these are simply supported beams with a UDL, or a uniformly distributed load on it, and these are the reactions. So this is the object, here's our free body diagram showing our loads and our reactions. Now we can combine those different restraints to ensure that an object is statically determinate, or that it is not moving or rotating in space. So we have a pin here and a roller here. So this is the one we just drew. Now look at this. We have two reactions some distance apart. Well, if we tried to spin this, this end can't kick up because it's being held down, and this end can't go down into the ground because it's being held up. We've got a reaction couple. So this object, even though it can rotate about this point and it could rotate about this point. The object as a whole can't rotate because it's held in place by these two reactions. A cantilever. Well, this was a fixed support. Remember, a fixed support stopped things from going up and down, back and forth, or rotating. Well, it looks like we've got reactions for all three degrees of freedom right here. So this one is statically determinate just like this, with one connection point. We've got a thing that is statically determinate. We could have some funny combinations. Now, this is not normal. I'm going to tell you right now, this is normal, and this is... If this is 90% of the design we do, this is 9% of the design we do, and this is 0.9% of the design we do. Yes, meaning that there's some other weird percentage out there. This one, we've got, it, we've got a roller here, so it stopped it from going up and down. We've got a reaction here, so it stopped it from going in this direction. 
And this is a solid arrow or a solid triangle, meaning that there's some way that we've stopped rotation about that point as well. This is, like I said, a very unusual condition. I just wanted to draw it to illustrate it. We actually had to do a detail like this in gold ring. It ended up not getting built. They ended up doing a, uh, um, they ended up changing the, the constraints. We d redesigned the cladding to hide a different connection. But this took about a week and a half of work to design this connection between Dave and I on an exposed architectural uh, element. So it was not an easy way to go about designing something. This is so easy that it's kind of just what we get almost for free. And I'm going to show you why that is. So remember, this, both of these could allow rotation at those spots. And um, this one could actually allow movement in that, in the X direction at that spot. So how can we possibly detail that? How could we make sure that that is true? Well, there are two ways that that happens. We release moment just naturally in the way most steel elements are detailed. The common way that we detail things in steel is that we have a beam coming into a column. The column is our reaction. The column is the thing that is acting like our red arrow upwards here. Um, and the way they detail it is just like this. This funny little clip has the ability to pry just a little bit. It allows just the tiniest little bit amount of rotation. And the tiniest little bit of rotation is rotation, which means we have allowed this object to rotate at the end, meaning there is no moment restraint at the end. The column stopped it from going up and down, but it hasn't stopped it from rotating. Now, we have two columns at each end. We have a column at each end of this beam. The columns together stop the object from moving back and forth in space, but they might splay just a little bit and allow some movement between them. So that means as a whole, one end is restrained, but one end isn't. Or the system is restrained with a reaction in the X direction, but internally we will allow some movement at the end. I know that this sounds like crazy nonsense talk. I get it. You're sitting there thinking, what the hell is she saying? We're allowing movement, but we're not. And we're saying it's restrained, but it's not really restrained. I'm going to tell you that I don't want you to stress out too much about it, that the way we normally detail things, most beams are a pinned roller support. Most of the beams are a pinned roller support. And even within that, most beams are a simply supported beam, meaning a pin roller, with a uniformly distributed load on it. And that is all the things we're going to design. That's the only challenges we're going to face. We might do a cantilever or two as well. Um, but we're not going to look at more complex things. If we had to restrain something for a moment, we have to work hard to restrain it for a moment. What we'd often do is top and bottom as well, so that thing couldn't rotate at that point. But we have to go out of our way to do that. Naturally, we get a roller. Unless the thing we're trying to connect gets too big. Imagine our beam look like this. And so we just have a little tiny column picking up that load. and we detailed it like that. Well, now all of a sudden, that connection is really, really long and it's trying to stop that thing from rotating. But if we don't want a moment connection, we don't want to restrain it from, from rotating. If we have a detail like that, we would have to design our column and our beam for that to be a moment connection, which means our, our column 
probably gets a whole lot bigger. So sometimes if we want to really make sure a pin connection is a pin connection, but we've got big ass members, we'll have to go out of our way because we are not getting this pin connection for free anymore. We have to go out of our way to detail it to make sure it is in fact a pin connection. So you can see here, this fancy bridge, they've actually detailed it to be a pin connection or a roller connection right there. Um, roller connections on buildings of our scale, again, this, this release in the x-axis, not a big deal. We get it for free because our columns can splay just the tiniest little bit. When we don't get it is bridge structures. If we actually try to restrain that, we can actually lock forces in that we don't want. Next time you're driving on, uh, on a highway or you're the passenger on the highway, please don't look if you're the driver. Um, if you're the passenger in a car or in some other mode of transportation and you go under a bridge, take a look at the end detail. They actually will look like this. And this right here is actually a Teflon bearing pad. So they actually allow the bridge to slip back and forth to make sure that we have a roller connection. They stop it from sliding off the bearing pad in the Z direction. Remember that direction that we're, we're not talking about. We're usually talking about a 2D plane. They'll stop it from sliding off the bearing pad on the, end, on the sides, but they allow it to move in the X axis. So this means for something to be in equilibrium, it's not moving and it's not rotating, which means a body in equilibrium may not rotate or translate in all degrees of freedom. To remain in equilibrium, there must be an equal and opposite force or moment to keep it in place. These are called reactions. In our 2D plane, we are saying that the sum of the forces in the Y direction have to be zero. The sum of the forces in the x direction have to be zero. And the sum of the moments about the z axes have to be zero. Uh, so the sum of the forces and reactions in each direction must equal zero. If we're talking about a system with three degrees of possible movement, movement, which is our 2D plane, we need to prove it's not moving in three directions or we need to figure out what it takes to make sure the sum of all of these equations is in fact zero, or what reaction, what value of reaction has to be there to make sure that the sums are zero. The best way to do it is with an example, and let's jump in to the downward view, and the rest of this lecture is calculations. Okay, let's jump into our first example. I like using the teeter-totter example because it visibly shows a pin connection. So you were probably thinking, I don't understand the pin connection. How does it allow rotation? Well, here you go. A teeter-totter is a real life example of a pin connection. This teeter-totter isn't sinking down into the center of the earth. This teeter-totter isn't sliding back and forth but we know that it can rotate about a an axis going in and out of the plane, in and out of the page, or about the Z axis in and out of the page. So I like this as an example here. Now, the very first example we're going to do uses two Shannons. Now, intuitively, if you know that this is, oops, This is P. Shannon, and this is P. Shannon. And if these two distances are the same, what do you intuitively think is going to happen? Does the teeter-totter go uh, up and down? No, you know that um, the sum of the forces in this direction is zero. 
So even though there's forces pushing down, there must be something pushing back up. Is the teeter-totter sliding back and forth in the x-axis? No, it's not. We don't know if there's a force being applied, but we know that this would stop it even if there was. We know that this could spin about this point. Well, there are two Shannons that weigh the exact same amount, and they're both the same distance away from the center of the teeter-totter. Do you think the teeter-totter will spin? I've watched my son play around, my sons play around on a teeter-totter like this, and they intuitively were able to figure this out. You know that if these two things are the same weight and the same distance apart, this is not going to spin, or it is going to be in static equilibrium. It is going to be statically determinant, and it's going to be in static equilibrium, meaning the sum of all the forces in the y direction are going to be zero, the sum of all the forces in the x direction are going to be zero, and the sum of all of the moments about this point right here in the z-axis, remember the z-axis is coming out of the plane, so everything trying to spin it about that axis is going to be zero. So if I gave you that force and that distance, let's figure out what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium. So let's draw this. So it says that Shannon weighs the same amount as Shannon 1 weighs the same as Shannon 2. You guys are really lucky. There are two Shannons in this world. Um, and the, the distance is the same from this center point right here. Now, I always like to redraw my problem. I find it very helpful. And I'm going to draw it as a free body diagram. Rather than draw a stick figure smiley face, I'm going to represent that, that I'm going to represent Shannon with an arrow or a force, a vector. So we have a teeter-totter. And I'm going to try for you guys to always draw forces in green or applied forces in green and reactions in red. This wouldn't normally be what we do, but it's just visually to help you along to see what is coming from where. You don't have to draw it in these colors. I'm just doing it as a visual aid for you guys. So we know that there is a teeter-totter pin here that's going to stop it from going up and down and stop it from going back and forth. So there is a restraint here. So there's a restraint in the x-axis and there's a restraint in the y-axis. We know that there's not a moment rota rotation because this teeter-totter, that's the whole point. It can rotate about that point. We know that there is a Shannon here and a Shannon here. We have P of Shannon 1 equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons and P of Shannon 2 equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons. And they have told us that this distance is the same, E1 and E2 both equal 0 0.8 meters. Well, let's start thinking about this. Let's sum all of the forces in the x-axis. We know that we always say everything in that direction is positive, and anything in that direction is negative. And we want to know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium, or for the sum of all the forces in the x-axis to be zero. Well, look at this. We know we have our Rx. Do you guys see any other things in the x-axis? I don't. So the sum of all of the forces in the x-axis needs to be zero to be in static equilibrium. Rx equals zero. That one seemed kind of easy. Let's sum our forces in the y-axis. And we want to know what it takes for this thing 
to be in static equilibrium, or for the sum of all of these forces to actually be zero. Well, we've got Shannon 1 going downwards. Remember, in the y-axis, and we've drawn ourselves a little diagram here to remind us, upwards is positive and downwards is negative. Well, we've got minus PS1, minus PS2, plus RY1 equals zero. Well, luckily we know uh, PS1 and PS2. We know those values. We have minus 0 0.65, minus 0 0.65, plus RY equals zero. RY equals, we bring those over and add them up, 1.3 kilonewtons. So for this to be in static equilibrium, this teeter-totter pin support has to be able to resist 1.3 kilonewtons. If this isn't strong enough to resist 1.3 kilonewtons, it won't work. We have to have something there that is strong enough to resist 1.3 kilonewtons. That's the reaction we need for this to be in static equilibrium. But there was another equation here. We know that to be in static equilibrium, the sum of the moments where everything going in that direction so that our thumb is coming out of the page. Remember, this is my right hand. I want my thumb to be positive, so my fingers curling this direction. So everything spinning in this direction is going to be positive. And I want to spin these about the Z axis. And I'm going to pick this point right here to talk about as the point I'm trying to spin about. I'm going to call it point O. I want to know if this thing is in static equilibrium or not. Well, we have PS1 trying to spin this in this direction. So we've got the moment due to Shannon 1, and we've got a moment, actually I'm not going to write that there like that, we've got a moment due to Shannon 1, and a moment due to Shannon 2, and maybe something here with this RY. Let's figure out what we've got there. Well, we know that Shannon 1 causes a moment of the force times the eccentricity from this point, or 0.65 times 0.8 about that point. And Shannon 2 causes a moment in this direction, or 0.65 times 0.8. I think intuitively you can see that those balance each other out. But let's go through it here with this calculation. For a moment to exist, it needs a force and an eccentricity. Well, Shannon 1 is trying to spin this in this direction. If I held my thumb, or if I put a pin right here in the page, like this, and I pushed my paper in the direction of that force, you can see my paper is trying to spin in that direction. If I curl my fingers in that same direction, so it's the same direction the paper tried to spin and point my thumb, my thumb is pointing out of the page, which is positive. So that means positive PS1 times E1 is causing that moment. Now let's look at PS2. If I put my finger right here and hold the paper and I push right here, I try to spin the paper in that direction. So if I curl my fingers in the direction the paper just tried to spin and then point my thumb, so this is my right hand, my fingers are curling in the direction I just saw the paper curl, and my thumb is right here on this pin. Well, my thumb is pointing in the negative direction. So minus PS2 times E2. RY. Well, if this is the point right here, and it's passing through it, did a force through the centroid cause rotation? No, there needed to be eccentricity for there to be moment. 
So Ry, you could say it's Ry times an eccentricity of zero, if you wanted, doesn't cause this to spin. Rx is passing through the centroid as well. To be a moment, you need a force and an eccentricity. Or this would be Rx times an eccentricity of zero. Neither of these are trying to cause this teeter-totter to spin. Well, we want to know if this does in fact equal zero here, or what it takes for this to be zero. Well, we have no unknowns that are stopping this from spinning. So the sum of this better well equal zero to be in static equilibrium. So let's fill this in. We had PS1 is 0 0.65 times E1, which is 0 0.8, minus our 0 0.65 times 0 0.8, does this in fact equal zero? Or what does it take for this to be zero? We have 0.65 times 0.8 equals 0 0.52 minus 0 0.65 times 0.8 or 0 0.52, or yes, indeed, zero equals zero. There was no unknowns to stop this from spinning, so to be in static equilibrium, the sum of all of those applied moments had to equal zero. It does, so it's in static equilibrium. So for this teeter-totter to be in static equilibrium, we needed a reaction that stopped it from sinking down into the center of the Earth. Otherwise, on its own, it was already in static equilibrium. So we need to just make sure there's a reaction of 1.3 there for this to not move, because as it was, the loads were balanced out and didn't try to cause it to spin. So that's worked out here for you again. We've shown, I've shown you visually just a slightly different way. I've rewritten those two eccentric forces as the moment and the force. So you can visibly see what we have done with these, um, these equations here. So you can see that I've redrawn that force with an eccentricity as a moment and a force through the centroid. And so these are added up through the centroid and must balance each other out. And this moment is now pretty easy to visually see that they balance each other out. You can see that this one tries to spin in this direction and this one tries to spin in this direction and that they are equal to each other, equal and opposite. What if Shannon 2 disappeared because she doesn't exist as a clone in this universe uh, and Dave got on the teeter-totter instead? So now Dave and I are sitting in the teeter-totter in the same spots Shannon and Shannon were sitting in. Now, we all know Dave is way heavier than Shannon, so we want to see if this is in static equilibrium. Intuitively, what do you think? You have two objects of different weight, the same distance apart on a teeter-totter. Is this in static equilibrium? Will it not translate in Y, not translate in X, and not rotate about Z? I think intuitively you already know that this will actually try to rotate. Dave is going to sink down to the ground and Shannon is going to go up into the air. If there is that movement, it is not in static equilibrium. There must be something causing this to rotate. So let's take a look at that, the way we would go about doing this mathematically. And the reason I like to do this is because you intuitively know these things with a teeter-totter, and I can show you mathematically a system that proves that, that we can then use on systems that might be a little bit harder to intuitively know what is going on. So this was two Shannons. Let's do Dave and Shannon equal distance.
Hold on one second. I need to tell Dave to sh close the door up there. <laughs> He's on a conference call and I can hear him. You guys probably can't, but it's very distracting to me. I keep I keep wanting to eavesdrop. <laughs> okay, so we have a teeter-totter with Dave and Shannon on it instead now. So instead of um, uh, uh, two Shannons, we have Dave and Shannon. And I will give you the weight of Dave here. So we have the same teeter-totter. And we have a reaction here that we don't know what it is. Hold on a second. Okay, I had to go up and actually shut the door. <laughs> um, okay, so we have um, the teeter-totter with Dave and Shannon on it. We know that there's a pin reaction here. We've visibly seen the teeter-totter pins. We've all been on a teeter-totter. We know that it doesn't sink down into the earth. So there must be some unknown reaction Y here. We know the teeter-totter doesn't move off in the X direction, so there must be some unknown reaction X here. We know there cannot be a moment reaction there, or else a teeter-totter wouldn't be any fun. It would be the most boring toy in the whole wide world. We know that there are two people sitting on this teeter-totter. There's Shannon, and there's Dave. This is P. Shannon and P. Dave, and they are the same distance apart. So E is the same for both of them. E hasn't changed. E is 0 0.8 meters. P of Shannon hasn't changed. The P of Shannon is still 0 0.65 kilonewtons. And the P of Dave, who is way heavier than Shannon, hi Dave. Hi Shannon. <laughs> is 0 0.85 kilonewtons. Now intuitively, I think you very obviously understand that this side of the teeter-totter is gonna sink down to the ground because Dave is heavier than Shannon. But let's go through the same process that we did up here with this teeter-totter. Let's sum our forces in the x direction, where everything going in that direction is positive. That's just a reminder to ourselves that that direction means positive, and that symbol just means sum. It's a Greek symbol for s or sum. Fx means forces in the x direction. And we want to know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium or for the sum of all the forces in the x direction to be zero. Well, let's see, what forces do we have in the x direction? We have Rx, well, Rx equals zero, perfect. We have static equilibrium in the x direction. We want the sum of all of the forces in the y direction to also be zero. So upwards is positive, so positive is the upwards direction of the y-axis, and we want the sum of all of those forces to be zero. Well, we have Shannon going downwards, which is not the positive direction, so minus PS, or it's just PS. We have Dave, who is going downwards, which is not the positive direction, or minus P Dave. We also have some unknown reaction that is stopping this teeter-totter from sinking down into the center of the earth, or some positive unknown Ry reaction. We know what PS and PD are. They're minus 0 0.65 minus 0.85 plus Ry equals zero, and we can calculate that Ry equals 1.5 kilonewtons. So for this teeter-totter not to sink down into the center of the earth, we need 
a reaction or a pin there that can support 1.5 kilonewtons. You know how you guys are going to be doing your project part ones? Well, you could have two Shannons, you could have Shannon and Dave. What if you had two Daves? What if you had two really heavy people sitting there? Well, for that to be the case, they're all the same general system for our Y, and we want to know the worst case. Now, that's just a thing to think about when you're doing part one. Okay, so we've got our Ry equals 1.5 kilonewtons. So for this teeter-totter not to sink down into the center of the Earth, we need an Ry of at least 1.5 kilonewtons. We also want to make sure this thing doesn't spin about the z-axis. So we want to make sure that the sum of all of the moments spinning about the z-axis equals zero. I'm going to spin this about this point right here, zero, or O, whatever you want to call it. The z-axis is what's going in and out of the page. And we know that Shannon is causing a moment on the teeter-totter, and we know that Dave is causing a moment on the teeter-totter. But this pin is what's holding it there, doesn't cause a moment on the teeter-totter. Let's break it down. To be a moment, you need a force and an eccentricity. And we're trying to spin it. We're imagining that there's literally a thumbtack right there in that point on the page. Well, does Shannon cause it to spin? Yes, there is a force and there is some distance away from that pin. It's trying to spin it in that direction. Let's curl the fingers of our right hand in that direction. My thumb is coming out of the page so it is a positive moment. Or positive force of Shannon times the eccentricity of Shannon. We have Dave trying to spin the teeter-totter in this direction. Let's curl my fingers in the way Dave is trying to make the teeter-totter spin. So my fingers are curled in that direction, and then I can look to my thumb to tell me if that is positive or moment, negative. My thumb is pointing downwards, which is the negative z axis. So Dave must be trying to spin it in the negative direction. Or negative P Dave force times eccentricity. Does our Y try to make this spin about that point? No, there's no distance from that point. You could say Ry times an eccentricity of zero, but we know that that is zero. And Rx times an eccentricity of zero is zero. So both of those things are trying to pass through the point we're talking about. So we can plug this in now. We have the force of Shannon is 0.65 and we know the eccentricity is 0.8, minus the force of Dave times the eccentricity of Dave. Let's plug this into our calculator. We have 0.65 times 0.8 equals 0 0.52, and 0.85 times 0.8, or minus 0 0.68, equals zero. 0.68, we have minus 0 0.16 kilonewton meters does not equal zero. So there is a remaining negative 0.16 kilonewton meters. So this is trying to spin about that point. It is not in static equilibrium. So this is not in equilibrium. So this is not in static equilibrium. This doesn't work. Now, we know it'll sink down until the teeter-totter sits on the ground, so it's not that big of a deal, and in fact, it's super duper fun. But you get the hint here, you get the idea of what we're trying to achieve. What would it take for this to be in static equilibrium. Anyone have any ideas on what we could do 
to make this be in static equilibrium. Here's the one that we just did. Here's it all worked out the same way we did the first one. Now, Shannon's lazy and doesn't want to move. She wants to stay sitting exactly where she is. What could Dave do to make this teeter-totter be in static equilibrium? Well, if the force is different, we need to probably scooch him forward on the teeter-totter to make this balance. We want the same moment. We want the moment in this direction to be the same as the moment in that direction so that they balance out. So for Shannon to stay right here, we want Dave to cause less of a moment spinning it in this direction. So if his force is higher than Shannon, his eccentricity needs to be lower. Now, how much do we need Dave to scooch? We don't know. We don't know, we could keep trying. We could move Dave and redo that calculation and see if the teeter-totter spins. Um, and if that didn't work, we could do it again. And if that didn't work, we could do it again. What if we just said, we don't want to do this calculation a bunch of times. What if we calculate what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium? What eccentricity do we need for this teeter-totter to be in static equilibrium? So we'll put an unknown there for Dave's eccentricity and see what it takes for this to actually be in static equilibrium. So this one is Shannon and Dave with Dave moving. Now, Dave could have stayed where he was and Shannon could have moved. The principles stay the same here. So let's draw our teeter-totter. We're going to draw our free body diagram. We know that the base of a teeter-totter has a pin connection. A pin connection stops movement in the y direction and it stops movement in x direction, but it does not stop rotation. So we'll have a reaction in the y direction and a reaction in the x direction, but it will not have a reaction about that point. We, it would be no fun if we welded that teeter-totter to that pin, yeah, we would have a moment reaction there. But that wouldn't make for a very fun teeter-totter. We want to allow it to be able to rotate there, but we want to see what it takes to be in equilibrium. Now when I was little, I was an only child, um, and we lived in the country, so my father set up a seesaw, or a, a sawhorse, for me, and I had a uh, big, long 2x10 um, that I would put a rock on the other side of the teeter-totter, and I would get on the other end, and I would, move the teeter I would move the rock around until it was just about my, uh, it just about balanced my moment so I could make the teeter-totter go up and down. It was very sad, as you can imagine. Okay, we want to make Dave that rock and figure out where Dave needs to be to balance out the moment I cause on the teeter-totter. So we know that Shannon was right here, and so this was P Shannon equals 0 0.65 kilonewtons, and we know that Shannon was 0 0.8 meters away from the center of the teeter-totter. Dave is going to move. We don't know how much. We don't know where. But P Dave stays the same. It is 0.85 kilonewtons. But now we have an unknown. Eccentricity of Dave. A free body diagram is good. We've got all our forces and our reactions and the distance from a point. ED is our placeholder for our distance. We've labeled it, so we know it's there. We just don't know what the value is. So this is still a valid free body diagram. We've indicated that there is an eccentricity there, but we don't know what it is. Now we want this 
thing to be in static equilibrium. Static equilibrium means that the sum of the forces in the y direction have to be zero, the sum of the forces in the x direction have to be zero, and the sum of the moments about the z axes have to be zero. So let's sum the forces in the x direction. Remember everything in that direction is positive and we've reminded ourselves of that. And we want this to be in static equilibrium or we want to know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium. The only force we have in that direction is our x. So for this to be in static equilibrium, our x can be zero. can sum the forces in the y direction. Everything upwards is positive, so everything downwards is negative. Shannon's force is trying to act downwards, and Dave's force is trying to act downwards. So minus 0.65, minus 0.85, and we have our y pushing upwards. We have minus 0.65, minus 0.85 that we bring over to the other side. Our y equals 1.5 kilonewtons. Remember, that shouldn't change. The weight of Dave and Shannon hasn't changed. This teeter-totter needs to still stop 1.5 kilonewtons from sinking down into the center of the Earth. Now, we want to know if this thing is in static equilibrium. So the sum of the moments about the z axes need to be equal to zero. Let's spin it about the point that it wants to spin about. Let's imagine a thumbtack right here or a pin right there, which is where there's a pin, and sum these moments about the z axes. So an axis right there through that pin. Well, Shannon is trying to spin the teeter-totter in that direction. To be a moment, you need a force and an eccentricity. Well, we have a force, and it is some distance from the point we're talking about trying to spin it about, so that's a moment. It is trying to spin it in that direction. If I curl my right hand fingers in that direction, I can now use my thumb to tell me if that's positive or negative. Well, my thumb is coming out of the page, which must be positive. So we have 0 0.65 times 0 0.8 or PS times ES. And then we have the moment caused by Dave. Dave is trying to spin this in this direction. Uh, he's still trying to spin it with 0.85 but we want to know what ED needs to be for this to be in equilibrium, for this to be true, for this to actually equal zero. We want to know what ED needs to be. Well, he's trying to spin the teeter-totter in this direction, so I curl the fingers of my right hand, and then I can use my thumb to tell me if that's positive or negative. Well, my thumb is pointing into the page, so it's minus 0 0.85, times some unknown eccentricity. So this is the P of Dave and the eccentricity of Dave. We want to know what this is to make this equation true. Our Y doesn't try to cause the teeter-totter to spin about that point, and our X doesn't try to cause the teeter-totter to spin about that point. So we have 0.65 times 0.8 minus 0.85 times ED equals zero. And we want this to be true. We want ED to be zero. So we can solve for what ED needs to be for this to be zero. Well, we've got uh, 0.65 times 0.8 that we'd bring over here and it would be negative, but then divide it by negative 0.85. So we've got minus 0.65 times 0.8 divided by minus 0.85, we've got ED needs to equal 0.61176. I'm keeping a bunch of uh, significant digits just for rounding. One year somebody got really upset that 
something equal to 0 0.0000001. So I'm just trying to keep some significant digits so that we can kind of keep our heads about this. So for this teeter-totter not to spin, Dave needs to be 0.61176 meters away from the pin. So this is a really good use of our equations of static equilibrium. We can figure out what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium. For this to be in static equilibrium, we need a reaction that stops the teeter-totter from sinking into the ground of, point of 1.5, and we need Dave to sit 0.61176 meters away from the teeter-totter pin. If Dave does that, this teeter-totter will be in static equilibrium. So here that is. Okay, here is where I'm going to blow your mind. That teeter-totter, it wasn't spinning about the pin. Let me ask you, let me ask you this. Was it spinning about um, Shannon's bum? No. Was it spinning about Dave's bum? No, it wasn't. Well, if it's not spinning about that point either, it's in static equilibrium. If it's not moving, it's got to be in static equilibrium. So it ain't moving and it ain't rotating no matter what point you pick to sum everything up about. What if I said we could take that imaginary pin that we had where the teeter-totter pin was, and even not acknowledging that that's where the physical pin is, what if we imagined that we put that imaginary pin right here and summed all of our moments about that point? So let's do that same problem, but sum it about Shannon instead. So, Shannon and Dave, with Dave moving, moving up, but some moments at Shannon. Now this takes a little bit of a mental leap, but if it's in equilibrium, it's not spinning about any point at all. It doesn't matter that the pin is physically at that point. If it's in static equilibrium, it's in static equilibrium. It can't be spinning about that point either because it's physically not spinning. Or we wanna know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium. We could imaginarily put the pin in that point right there. Let's try it. Let's do it that way. We're going to do the exact same thing, but instead of spinning about point zero, we're going to spin about Shannon. So let's call this point S. So it's the same free body diagram, but we're going to spin it about point S this time. So let's just go through those equations. So sum the forces in the X direction where that way is positive. Well, it doesn't seem to change anything for that. We still have our x equals zero. Let's sum the forces in the y direction. We still have Shannon trying to act downwards and Dave trying to act downwards, which are both negative, plus our y equals zero, and we solve for this an Ry equals 1.5 kilonewtons. Now I've told you that instead of spinning about this point, or imagining that we're spinning about that point, we're going to spin about Shannon instead, or we're going to put that imaginary thumbtack right here. So let's sum the moments about the z-axis, but we're going to sum them about Shannon instead. Well, if we put a thumbtack 
right here, does Shannon try to cause that system to spin? Remember, you need a force and an eccentricity, and we're talking about spinning about this point right here. No, the force of Shannon acts right through that. Or we have PS times zero. You need a force and an eccentricity, and there is no eccentricity, so it's zero there. Dave is trying to spin about this point in this direction. I can curl my fingers about that and put my thumb where Shannon is, and it's in the negative direction. So minus P Dave, and Dave's eccentricity from Shannon is this distance, or 0 0.8 plus ED. We don't know what that total, we don't know what ED is, we don't know what that total distance is, and we want to figure out what ED is. Here's where I'm going to blow your mind. If we're trying to imagine spinning about this point right here, our Y would try to cause the teeter-totter to spin about that point. Remember, we want to find out what it takes for this not to spin about Shannon, because that would be crazy if the teeter-totter all of a sudden started spinning about Shannon. So we want to figure out what it takes for that to not happen. Well, our X still passes in this line. So our X doesn't try to cause the teeter-totter to spin about Shannon because it is zero distance from this point. But our Y is. We put a thumbtack right here. Our Y is trying to spin the page in that direction or like that. We can curl our fingers in that direction, and then our thumb tells us that that's a positive rotation. Or we have plus our y times its eccentricity, which looks like it's 0 0.8. And we want to know what it takes for this to be 0. Well, we know the force of Shannon is 0 0.65 times 0 minus the force of Dave, which is 0.85, times the 0.8 plus ED, plus our Y. We've already calculated our Y is 1.5 times 0 0.8 equals 0. Let's clean this up a little bit. We have 0.65 times 0 is 0, minus 0.85 times 0.8 plus ED, or we can multiply our minus 0.85 times both of these things. So minus 0.85 times 0.8 equals minus 0 0.68, and minus 0.85 times ED is minus 0 0.85 ED. And then we have plus 1.5 times 0.8, or 1.2, equals 0. So we have um, minus 0.68 plus 1.2. We can bring that over to the other side and divide by 0.85. Or we can have minus 1.2 plus 0.85 divided by minus 0.85, We have minus 1.2, ah, I didn't use brackets properly, uh, plus 0.68 divided by 0.85. And we get that, so, sorry, we have um, minus 1.2 plus 0.68, or minus 0.52, divided by 0.85, and we get ED equals... 0 0.61176 meters. So it didn't matter which point we imagined it spinning about to determine that it was in equilibrium. To be in equilibrium, it had to be in equilibrium everywhere. And if it's in equilibrium anywhere, we could pick any point to spin it about or imagine that we were spinning it about. It didn't matter which point we picked. It, the fact is, is we want it to be in equilibrium and we're figuring out what it takes to be in equilibrium. So that means we can use our three equations 
but imagine any point we want to, to imagine spinning it about to determine equilibrium. So here it is, just slightly worked out another way where we may reuse those actual values and see if it makes sense. I also do it by summing it about Dave instead of Shannon. So I've done it two ways here. Why don't we try something that looks more like what we're trying to do? We want to figure out what it takes for this beam to be in equilibrium. We only have two reactions here. That seems a bit weird, but it doesn't look like we have any forces in the x-axis. Before I go ahead and do any calculations for this, what end do you think is going to have a bigger reaction? If I sat on my table and sat more at one end than the other, which end do you think is going to have the bigger reaction? I think looking at this, you would intuitively say that more of the load is going to go over here. Do you think it's going to be by a small amount or a big amount? Well, these forces start to get pretty heavy over here. I think we're going to have a lot more of the load at this end than at this end. So we have um, a beam that is uh, 20 meters long, so there are 10 spaces at 2 meters each, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, so the length of our beam is 20, and they've told us that every 2 meters there's another force being applied. We want to know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium, or that it's not moving up and down, it's not moving back and forth, and it's not spinning in space any point in space. We don't want it to be spinning about the left axis end or about the right end or about the middle. So we know that if it's not spinning about one spot, it's not spinning about any spot. So we can pick what point works for us to try to calculate this. So let's go through and do this using our handy dandy three equations. I am going to write that I think right end is going to be quite a bit bigger than the left end. We looked at that and we thought that the right end was going to be a lot bigger than the left end. Let's draw our beam. So there's my beam, and it is 20 meters long. I've got 10 at 2 meters equals 20 meters. I want this to be in static equilibrium, which means it's not sinking down into the earth, which means there must be a reaction here and here, or the left end and the right end, we know that there should be um, a, a reaction that stops it from moving in the x direction, but it doesn't look like there was applied load in the x direction. And we know that we had a in steadily increasing amount of load, where this was 14 kilonewtons, and this was 4. Six, oh no, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen all in kilonewtons. So this is our free body diagram. We have all our loads, we have all of our reactions, 
and we have all of the distances relative to each other. We know that this total distance is 20 meters, and that's 2, and that's 4, and that's 6, and that's 8, and that's 10, and so on. So we have everything we need to make sure that this is um, uh, a free body diagram. Is it in static equilibrium? Well, we don't know. We know that for it to be in static equilibrium, the sum of all the forces in the x direction have to be zero, the sum of all of the forces in the y direction have to be zero, and all of the moments about the z axes have to equal zero. So let's see if they are. Some of the forces in the x direction need to be zero for this to be in static equilibrium. Well, we know that direction is positive. We're reminding ourselves of that there. We're summing everything up in, uh, for forces in the x direction, and we want it to be in static equilibrium. Well, we have the, for the reaction Rx equals zero. So in the x direction, static equilibrium. We want to sum up the forces in the y direction. So everything upwards is positive and everything downwards is negative. Let's start by looking at all our forces. We have 4 plus 5 plus 6. Oh, nope, I'm doing that wrong. Look at that. What direction are these all going? They're all going downwards. Downwards is negative. We have minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8, minus 9, minus 10, minus 11, minus 12, minus 13, minus 14. We have two unknown reactions. We don't know what their values are, but we know that a beam is going to be supported on some columns over here. So there's something holding it up, and we need to know what value that needs to be to hold this beam in place. So we have an R left end and a reaction at the right end. I've drawn them in the upwards direction. An arrow change would tell us if we were right or not. Um, but let's see what it takes. We have plus RL plus RR, and we want to know what it takes for this to equal zero. Well, we can bring all of these numbers over to the other side and change their, um, their po negative to positive. So we've got 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 plus 14 equals 99. But we have two unknowns in one equation. We can't solve this. RL plus RR equals 99 kilonewtons. That doesn't help us out. We now know that the entire system needs to resist 99 kilonewtons to be in static equilibrium, but we don't know how much is needed at each end here. We've guessed that it probably needs to be more over here, but this doesn't allow us to calculate that. We have one more equation we can use. We know that this beam can't be spinning in space to be in static equilibrium. And it doesn't matter if we talk about it spinning about here, or if we talk about it spinning about here, or if we talk about it spinning about here. Let's try it talking about spinning about this point right here. Let's sum our moments about the z-axis, where everything's spinning in that direction, like that, is positive. And we want to know what it takes to be in static equilibrium. And let's pick this point right here. Let's pick the left end. So this is me telling myself I'm picking the left end, or point L here. Well, reaction L is passing right through L. To have a moment, you need a force times an eccentricity. There is no eccentricity of RL from L. So it doesn't cause a moment. Rx passes directly through point L, so it doesn't cause a moment. And 4 kilonewtons passes directly through the point RL. Look, there's no eccentricity. 4 times 0 is going to equal 0. So 4 doesn't try to cause it to spin. 
Five, however, five kilonewtons does have an eccentricity. If we imagined a thumbtack right here and we push the paper, it tries to spin it in that direction. I can use my thumb to tell me that that means it's spinning about point L in the negative direction. Or minus five times the eccentricity from that point or the distance from that point. Well, each one of these was two meters. So times two meters. Well, look at this. Six is trying to spin it in this direction. All of them are trying to spin this paper in that direction, so the negative direction, and the distance away increases by two meters. So we also have minus six times four, minus seven, so five times two, six times four, seven times six meters, minus eight kilonewtons times eight meters, minus nine kilonewtons, times 10 meters minus 10 kilonewtons times 12 meters minus 11 kilonewtons times 14 meters minus 12 kilonewtons times 16 meters minus 13 kilonewtons times 18 meters minus 14 kilonewtons times 20 meters and we have RR trying to spin it in this direction. If I put a thumbtack right here and push my paper in the direction of RR, if I push this like this, it's trying to spin it in this direction. If I curl my hands in that direction, my thumb will tell me if that's positive or negative. So that is trying to spin in the plus direction or positive direction, RR times its eccentricity, which is also 20 meters. And all of that has to equal zero. So we can plug this all into our calculator and bring it over to the other side, which will be positive, and then divide by 20. So let's plug that in. 5 times 2 plus 6 times 4 plus 7 times 6 plus 8 times 8, plus 9 times 10, plus 10 times 12, plus 11 times 14, plus 12 times 16, plus 13 times 18, plus 14 times 20, equals uh, 1,210 divided by 20. R, R equals 60.5 kilonewtons. So we have one of our reactions now. Well, look at this. If we plugged that into this equation, we could probably find RL. RL equals 99 minus RR, or RL equals 99 minus 60.5. RL equals 99 minus 60.5, 38.5 kilonewtons. So for this beam to be in static equilibrium, which means not go up and down, or slide back and forth, or spin about any point, we need RR to be at least 60.5, or be able to support 60.5 kilonewtons, and RL needs to be able to support 38.5 kilonewtons. Let's just check what our intuition told us. Our intuition told us that the right end should be bigger than the left end. Well, our right end is 60.5 and our left end is 38.5. So we use the same principles that we did on the teeter-totter where the obvious, where the answer was obvious. We knew what the answers would be with the teeter-totter. But we did the mathematical solution so that we could see that it was a good method to actually calculate the values. Because this one, it wasn't as obvious to figure out what point it would spin about. Well, it doesn't matter. We can talk about it not spinning about any point we want. 
Even still, we made a prediction about what we thought would happen. And it's a good habit to get into to do that check to see if your answers come out with what you were expecting. So let's do another problem. Let's do a beam that has a point out here, a load out here. So we have a backspan and a cantilever, and there's reactions here. Now, if you're paying, if, if you have ever gone swimming, you know that this is what a diving board looks like. There is a support that holds it right here, and a support that holds it right here, and an arrow on it. Now, this is actually a spring, so it boings a little bit, but if you actually look at the detailing of it, this actually ends up being a bit of a roller at one end that they'll design into it as well. So we want to know what the reactions are for this to be in static equilibrium. So let's ask ourselves, what end do we think will be higher? Do you think this is going to support most of the load, or do you think this is going to support most of the load? I would even take a pen and try it out. If I put a support here and here, and I push right here, oh, look at that. It wants to kick up at this end. It wants to try to spin about that point. What if I actually held it in place so that I could hold this end down? Not just support it from sinking down into the center of the earth, but actually held it so that it didn't shoot up into the sky as well. Well now, if I push on this, I can feel that it's trying to kick up here and push down right here. So my prediction is that I think the left end is going to try to kick up on me. Let's draw this out. Let's draw the free body diagram and go through those calculations. So we have a beam that looks like that. Uh, I drew them in black, I apologize. This is our X, this is our L, and this is our R. The question told us that this was 1.2 meters, and this was 0.4 meters, and that there was an applied load of 1.5 kilonewtons happening at the tip. And we want to know what it takes for this diving board not to sink down into the center of the earth or shoot up into the sky or spin about any point. When I did it with my finger, we saw that it tried to spin about this point. But we know that for it to be in static equilibrium, not spinning about that point, it can't spin about any point. So we might as well use this point to talk about. I'm going to tell you it is my habit when I'm trying to solve for reactions to always pick this point. It just keeps things smooth and simple for me. You can pick whatever point you want to try to imagine spinning this about, but I am always going to use the left end. So remember, to be in static equilibrium, the forces in the x direction have to be zero, the forces in the y direction have to be zero, and the sum of the moments about the z-axis have to be zero. So sum of the forces in the x-direction, well, we have our x is the only force in that direction. It happens to be a reaction. So if there's no force applied, there's no force to resist, which means our reaction is zero. I could solve for uh, the forces in the y direction now and have two unknowns, then solve for my moments about z, and then go back to my y equation. I'm going to jump right to the moment equation. I am going to sum my moments about the z axes where everything in that direction is positive 
and I want to know what it takes to be in equilibrium, and I'm going to pick my left reaction to imagine where my thumbtack is. Now, if that's where my thumbtack is, L doesn't try to cause it to spin about that point. This is where my imaginary thumbtack is. L passes right through the point. So you need a force and a distance to have a moment. There is no distance, so it would be reaction L times zero, which gives us no moment. Our X is the same thing. It passes through the point we're talking about. So there is no moment due to our X. Our R is some distance away from RL, or the point we're trying to imagine spinning about. If I put um, a thumbtack right here and pushed on the paper in this line right here, my paper tries to spin in that direction. If I curl my fingers of my right hand in that direction, my thumb will tell me if that is a positive or a mo negative moment. It's upwards, so it is a positive moment. I've got plus RR times some eccentricity, and my eccentricity is 1.2 meters. Now I'm still imagining my thumbtack here, and I've got 1.5 kilonewtons pushing downwards. If I curl my fingers in the direction it just tried to spin the page, my thumb will tell me if that's positive or negative. My thumb is pointing into the page, which is the negative z direction. So minus 1.5 times my eccentricity, which is this distance here, or 1.2 plus 0.4. Those are the only things trying to cause this object to spin. And I want to know what it takes for it not to spin, or for the sum of all of these moments to be zero. So now I can figure out what reaction I need at the right end to make sure that this is in static equilibrium, or that the sum of all of the moments is, in fact, zero. I have minus 1.5 times 1.6. Bring it over here, it'll be positive, and divide it by 1.2. So 1.5 times 1.6 divided by 1.2 equals 2. RR equals 2 kilonewtons. So it is going in the positive direction. Let's now find RL. Let's sum the forces in the Y direction. Everything upwards is positive. And I want to know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium, or for the sum of all of those forces to, in fact, be zero. I have RL acting upwards. I have RR acting upwards, but I know that that is two. And I have 1.5 kilonewtons acting downwards, which is negative. And I want to know what it takes for this to be in static equilibrium or for all of these to be zero. I can rearrange this and RL equals minus 0.5 kilonewtons. Well, I drew RL going upwards. This negative tells me that I drew my arrow wrong. I will always draw my my reactions in the positive direction because that tells me that if I get a negative I know they actually go in the negative direction. If I had drawn this going downwards and got a negative direction or a negative value that would have meant it was actually going in the positive direction. So I try to keep, remember, a negative means that I drew it wrong. I guessed wrong. I don't know if these are positive or negative. I threw out a guess. I drew them in the positive direction. And then getting a positive or negative answer tells me that's true or not. So I will always draw them in the positive direction so that a positive means it really is positive, And a negative means that my wrong answer of a positive is actually in the negative direction direction. So here's what you can do. You can redraw this 
as an arrow going down or fill in that that is minus 0.5. RL equals minus 0 0.5 kilonewtons is equal to RL equals 0 0.5 kilonewtons with a downward arrow. That negative means that my arrow is really in the other direction. So if I draw it in the positive direction and have a negative number, it is the same thing as drawing it in the negative direction and including the actual value. So these two things are the same. I will often not redraw it just because then you start to get into this funny thing where you're redrawing everything all the time. So I will often keep this in the positive direction um, and fill in that it is a negative number. I'd like to point out though that that checks out with what we thought would happen. That when we just held it from moving downwards and we pushed on it, this end tried to kick up. To stop it from rotating, we needed forces at both of these places. But by stopping this from kicking up, which could be done by just having a force in the y direction, we still stopped rotation. What happens if we do the same question with a shorter backspan? What happens then? Let's do the same problem, but shorten up that backspan. So, um, do I have a shorter, I have a really tiny little pencil I could use. I don't have a short pencil I could use. I could use, uh, I'll use my eraser. When I had my pen and I put my supports here like this, the back end tried to kick up and I could hold it like this. Well, now I have to move my support over to here and we're gonna see what it does, what impact does it have on those reaction values. So let's draw our same diving board problem, but we're going to have a shorter backspan now. I'm going to draw my reactions upwards, even though I know that might not be the case, because that means if I get a negative value, I know that that means it actually goes downwards. And we have an applied load of 1.5 kilonewtons. And this is 0 0.4 meters. And this is 0 0.4 meters. So we have the same load with the same cantilever. The only thing that's different is the backspan. So let's see what impact that has on our values here. We're going to sum our forces in the x direction, where everything in that direction is positive, and we have Rx equals zero. Let's now sum our moments about the z-axis so that it's in equilibrium and everything spinning in that direction is positive, and let's again still pick the left end. Well, we're putting an imaginary thumbtack right here, and we're imagining RR spins the page in that direction. If I point my thumb in the direction uh, that it goes with my fingers curled, I get a positive value, or RR is positive, times its eccentricity, which is 0 0.4 meters. Put my imaginary thumb tack here, and I've got 1.5 meters trying to spin my page in that direction, curl my fingers in the direction it's trying to spin, my thumb tells me that it's spinning in the negative direction, or minus 1.5 times 0.4 plus 0.4 or times 0.8. And I want to know what it takes for this not to spin. I can plug this into my calculator 
1.5 times 0.8 divided by 0.4 equals 3, or RR equals 3 kilonewtons. Look at this. Last time, RR was 2 kilonewtons, and this time it's 3 kilonewtons. The value of applied force hasn't changed, but this front reaction has gone up. So what do you think has got to happen to the back reaction to keep it in place? Well, let's sum our forces in the y direction, where everything upwards is positive, and we've got RL plus RR, which is 3, minus 1.5 kilonewtons, our applied load downwards, equals 0. RL equals minus 1.5 kilonewtons. So for this to be in equilibrium, we need to hold this back part down with more force. Remember, that was us trying to hold down this back end here when we pushed on that point right there. So if you make the back span shorter, you increase the front force, and you have to hold that down with a bigger force as well, or a bigger reaction. So we can see that we have three handy-dandy equations that we can use to calculate what it takes for something to be in equilibrium. And we've learned a few things about cantilevers. That was just a fun bonus. So the takeaways for this lecture, let me just make it so that you can see me here. Get my lamp out of the way, which is what I hang the camera off of. Sorry, guys. Um, so for this, so what we've learned in this lecture is that moment is force times eccentricity. A force not acting through the centroid can be rewritten as a force through a centroid with a moment. There are six degrees of freedom, movement in three directions and rotation in three directions. We need, if we want something to be in equilibrium, we have to restrain it from movement in all six degrees. But we often flatten that down into a 2D problem to solve at a time. We know that if it's in equilibrium, we can sum all of the forces and moments about any point to figure out what it takes for it to be in equilibrium. If we do this, we can determine the forces or moments, if we had them, moment reactions, we can figure out what it takes or what those reactions need to be to not have translation or moment, or basically what it takes to keep that thing in equilibrium. And if we have a beam with supports here, we can figure out what those reactions are to hold that beam from sinking down into the center of the earth. Well, that's handy because if those supports are columns, now maybe we can figure out what it takes for that column not to crumple under that beam load. So we're starting to get somewhere in our calculations. So that's all well and good. We have a beam and we know we can figure out what the reactions are. If we put a point load on it, that's great. We can figure out what those reactions are. But how does that point load get from here over to here? What is happening in that length of that beam to get that load over to here? And that is the challenges we're gonna to start to face over the next two weeks. We can now look at a system and look at it structurally and see what is happening to that system as a whole. We can look at all the external loads and reactions for it to be in equilibrium. But something has to be happening inside that object for that load to get to that reaction point. And that, we have to figure out the internal forces of the objects. So next week and the week after, we're going to be diving in to internal forces. And we're going to learn some neat tricks on how we can handle those calculations. So the next two weeks, very intense. I apologize that they're at the end of the term, 
but we have to learn these things in a linear way. I've tried to make the last lecture as low key as I possibly can, give you a little breather before the end of the term, but next week's lecture and the week after, we learn so much information. That is gonna be crucial stuff for you to be able to do your part two project and um, assignment 10. And I can guarantee you that those are the two most important lectures to be able to do everything we do in structures too. So again, I apologize that the intense lectures are at the end of the term, but that's how we have to do it in a linear manner to actually get any answers. So we'll take a deep breath. Next, Next week is, is going to be calculation heavy. heavy. Some, Some of you are going to pick it up quick and you're not going to need to hang around for all of the examples. Some of you are going to be happy that I go through several examples for you to have a look at. So don't get overwhelmed. If you find it easy, break off, do the calculations on your own, see how it works out for you, but you have it there as a reference. For those of you that like lots of work through problems, they're going to be there for you, or we're going to film them next week when we start to look at trust analysis with internal forces. So see you next week.